Guys, I'm so excited tonight because I was reading a book and that book was so inspiring to me. I'm gonna show you. It's this book, it's called Sacred Kink. And it's by an author called Lee Harrington, and I never ever heard of him. Uh, which is apparently a weird thing, because this guy is like huge in the BDSM community, and I had no clue. Well, whatever, do you know? So, and I thought, you know what, Just let's just send him a message and ask him if he, if he would be willing to, to tell us a bit more about his book in a YouTube video. And he said yes, and then of course I had no clue what to do, but here he is. And I would love to introduce you to Lee Harrington. Um, I love this guy. I mean, just not just for his personality, but also because he's uh, he's inspiring in so many ways. He's not just an example in how you find your true self and how you look for it, but he's modest. Um, he's not too arrogant to come here and share. Um, he knows so much about so many things. He's he's written three books. Uh, one of the books is the book that I just showed you, Sacred Kink. Uh, but next to that book he wrote two other books. And one of them is called Playing Well with Others. And it's all about exploring what happens in the kink community. If you're interested into being educated on how the kink community works, uh, then I should definitely recommend you to read that book. And the other book is a book that I think you should definitely be interested in. And that's a book about rope bondage. It's called Shibari You Can Use. So if you love playing with ropes or being tied in ropes, read this book. I want to invite you all to give them a huge round of applause. I know this is a video, it doesn't matter, but here is Lee Harrington. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me on and you are so kind. I really appreciate it. That was that was very loving way to, to introduce me. I uh, it's actually funny. I have I, I had this moment about a year ago where I realized I have ten books now. And uh, I've been in the BDSM and kink communities for since 96. Wow. And part of that journey has been what you're talking about there, right? And part of what you've been doing on this channel, which is about finding out who you want to be as a submissive, who you want to be as a person. And I feel so blessed that my journey with all of its highs and its lows, right? <laughs> because that's part of being human. It is. has given me a chance to do some of that. And I'm excited to share some of this experience with you. Before we start, huh, I'm, I'm going to ask you anyway to, te to tell us a bit more about you uh, from your specific uh, point of view. But before we start, share with us, what is your vision? What are you here on this planet to bring to the world? I named my website Passion and Soul because I realized that that, which, that is my icky guy, right? Like that thing that intersects that which is my passion, that which is that is my career, that which is my uh, what the world actually needs and wants, that which I can bring people together for is the notion of finding passion. What are we excited about? And that can be looked at as the sexual passion side, but really the passions of our heart. And when I talk about the idea of soul, it is that which is our intrinsic self. Who am I inside when no one else is looking? When no one else is around, who am I, not even in the mirror, but inside my own closed eyes? Who am I? And in my spiritual path, I've had it been made very clear that my work on this planet is to weave webs between people so that they can help each other find that. Is to open up doorways of possibility so that people can go, oh, maybe, maybe that's me. For example, uh, I'm a transgender man. I was assigned female at birth. Mm -hmm. And I've met people who, when they've met me, they went, wait. I have journeys that are like you, but I thought the only transgender people out there were people like Caitlyn Jenner, who were sports athletes who used to be read as men and now they're women. What do you mean there's other possibilities out there? And so for me, it's about opening up those doorways of possibility so people can find passion in their soul. 
Wonderful. So let's imagine that, that what you're doing is super successful and you're touching hearts of pretty much anyone in the world. What would the world look like? I think the world would look more kind. Because if I see the possibilities of the lives of other people that are out there, I wouldn't see them as having to be strange or wrong or bad. And I might have more kindness to what's happening on their journey because I might understand them just a little bit more. Wonderful. Well, let's work on that. Um, I would love to, uh, to uh, have a chat with you about the book Sacred Kink. He's not just a leader in BDSM, well, he's teaching for over 20 freaking years. Don't ask him what his age is. On the other side, he's also a spiritual leader. He's helping people uh, in their spiritual path, but also in their personal development. Uh, he's doing rituals as well, and he knows a lot about it. And that's also why I think it's so interesting uh, to talk with him about the book. Um, Lee, I know that your BDSM journey is a long one already. You started in 1996, you said. So... What is the biggest lesson that you learned from, from your whole journey? I would say my biggest lesson in exploring these things we call kink mm -hmm. or BDSM or getting freaky, whatever it is, <laughs> uh -huh. is figuring out the skill set on how to say, this is my yes, that this is my authenticity. Because in my life, a lot of my time, I've said things like, well, I don't want to do this. Well, mm -hmm. I know I'm not into that. And same thing in sexuality. I, I said, this is, you know, we can do that. We can't do this. We can't do this, but let's do things. Mm -hmm. As compared to saying, this is what I long for. Because in practicing that in my sexual and kink life, I've been able to practice it more with how I interact with my biological family how I pursue my career and my work, how I interact with who I spend time with over coffee. What is my yes and how to be authentic with it? So could you give me an example of what changed, for instance, in the, communi in the communication with your biological family? Like you said, I mean, that's for me is challenging. So I would love to hear from you how that changed for you. So my father and I have a very complex and not positive in the history relationship. Mm -hmm. But now that I'm in my 40s, we're trying to find love and space for each other. Uh, and for a long time, I would just say like, well, I guess I could put up with him for half an hour. I guess I could go to that family gathering mm -hmm. as compared to what I now do, which is I think about what spaces my father and I might have success in, right? Like I now know when he and I travel together, rather than being either in my home or in his home, mm -hmm. we do better. Nice. Right? We thrive there. Or if we're out for food and we get to break bread together, there's joy there. And so instead of saying, well, I guess I could go to your house or like that kind of him and uh, those mm -hmm. kinds of feelings, mm -hmm. what I now do is say to him, dad, it would be wonderful to go to Thai food with you. How do you feel about next Friday? So I'm doing it on my terms mm -hmm. and I'm telling him the things I want to do rather than what I'll cope with. And that's changed a lot because I got to practice those skills, both as somebody who is a dominant, but also as somebody who is a submissive. I'm referred to sometimes as a switch. Uh, I, I think of myself as liking to connect with people. Uh -huh. And how do I connect with a specific person? And having held all these different roles, I feel really blessed to get to practice that skill of asking for yes. That's cool. I can see that. So it's actually like what you say is in BDSM as well, I, you have to negotiate, you have to discuss uh, before you start a scene. So actually when you're deciding to spend time with someone, you decide what you're going to do. And, and I always say that, um, that, that if you don't discuss it, it's, it's, it's not negotiated. So what you say is 
you learned how to negotiate and how to find out what you want and this is something that you could translate to other parts in your life such as how you spend time with your dad I, I love the word you just used of discussion because at least in America uh -huh. when people hear the word negotiation sometimes it's about what does which, which it, what is every partner willing to lose or give up right there's this business story based in capitalism that says a negotiation is oh I guess I can do that I can guess I can do that which I think is a great place to start because people are learning how to negotiate. But for me, that length of time in the scene taught me that I want to know where you'll thrive and I want to know where I will thrive rather than cope. My early times in negotiation were, I don't want you to spank me and I don't want to be gagged. I was leading with my no. Yeah, yeah. Right. I was I telling people my no's rather than saying, I saw you do get caned by someone. Uh huh. Could we do that? It was so sexy. It was so beautiful. And not just the caning, but what did I like about seeing that? Oh, I loved seeing you moan. Right. I loved seeing you be vulnerable. I loved that. Oh, so, and then my partner might say, well, I don't want to be caned today, but you know, having, you know, hair pulling really makes me moan. Uh -huh. And suddenly I get my needs met, my desire, my hunger, which was I want to see them moan. And they get to not just be okay with it, but love having their hair pulled. <sighs> so juicy. There are so many people out there, especially when people start, that I discovered is that they think because they are the submissive that they should just do whatever the dominant is telling them to do but what you're actually saying is that you're creating a scene together and that you're looking for exactly what you say is where people thrive that's amazingly thank and you I, I learned it some hard ways my first two relationships in bdsm were both with me as a slave or submissive mm -hmm. identified person And uh, they are th things that I look back at, and they were not positive relationships. Did I learn good things about me? Yes. But I look back, and they were fairly abusive because we were following the story that you just brought up. Yeah. That once you put that collar on, you have no say. In some cases, I don't even want to hear from you. Right? But this is what we want you to do. And you are only what I sculpt you into, which is a hot fantasy, yeah. right? Super yeah. hot fantasy. But what I realized over time with the people that I played with after those two relationships, and there were parts of those relationships that were good, mm -hmm. right? I don't want to say it's a hundred percent, but when I started playing Four with people. people after that, <laughs> and I found out about say a safe word, I had no idea about safe words before. Oh, no really? idea. Oh. Because um, this is a conversation in the early 90s, right? Like okay. that just wasn't part of that conversation very much yet. Oh. Uh, and as someone who just had never read or seen, there weren't, like SM 101 was coming out, right? Like it wasn't, uh, it was all very underground. Yeah, I see. And, Uh, and I, so I was playing with somebody that I knew not going with being part of a community. And if you're not part of a community or we're not watching videos like yours, people just don't know. No, that's true. And if you didn't know right now, if you're watching right now and you didn't know, that doesn't make you a bad person, right? It means you're learning now. And I feel so blessed that I had someone who I was bottoming to, right? Rather than being submissive, I wasn't like putting on a collar, I wasn't surrendering, but I was doing activities with, with him. I was bottoming mm -hmm. to him. And he uh, said to me, I want to know what makes you tick. I want, you are an instrument. How do I play you? That's awesome. And I went, oh, I have to learn me. Shoot. <laughs> Right? And that actually like, it requires a lot of honesty and I mean especially when you're young I can imagine that that's challenging 
<laughs> and confronting, no? Yeah, and here I was in my early 20s trying to figure out, well, w what do I actually want? Yeah. Because I might have a story in my head of what I wanted. Mm -hmm. But was that story based on my desires or was that story based on what a past lover had or what, the, or what BDSM porn told me I should be into? Yeah. <laughs> I found out that, that my stories are a lot connected to, what, to the... Um, um, to the vision that my mom had on how I should be and uh, that was also very confronting and well I, she knows now about my submission and my DS relationship and she despises it and um, and that makes it but in in a way it makes it actually easier to to separate what she thinks I should be from what I think that I am which is different. Yeah. yeah. And I also had to ask myself in that direction, am I doing this just to be rebellious? Uh, yeah. Or is this <laughs> who I really am and what I really want? Yeah. Both answers so are okay. Is, yeah. Exactly. But just sit, sit with that question. And, and be honest with it. Exactly. Like, I'm doing this to be rebellious and that's okay too, but just be aware of it. Absolutely. I so agree with that. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. If there is one thing that you would want the world to know about BDSM, to learn about BDSM, what would it be? That I think the one thing I would want the world to know about BDSM is that it's part of a rainbow of things that mm -hmm. I call kink, right? B, bondage, D, discipline or dominance and then S, submission sadism and masochism or submissive as uh, 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 surrender and mastery or mistresses right depending on who's defining it but this thing called kink is simply the things that other people that the, me the media thinks aren't normal and almost all of us have one thing that's a little kinky every single one of us I agree. And if you have something that's what the world might call kinky, you like feet. You like hair pulling. You like a spanking one while you like playing dress up, putting on Japanese anime costumes while making out. You're not alone. Every single one of us is into something that's different than other people. And you're not alone in being a little bit different because all of us are. You're mesmerizing, you know that? <laughs> Seriously. One of the reasons actually why I uh, started this channel is because I believe that BDSM has lessons for everyone. There was so much that I learned in my journey into BDSM, into submission, that I wish that I knew when I was in a vanilla relationship because I think also vanilla relationships can benefit from lots of the rituals from BDSM. What's your vision on that? What do you think? So in the world worlds of kink, because there isn't just one community no, and there isn't true. just one way to be kinky. And I'm going to use the word kink mm -hmm. uh, personally because I think it's a bigger world. Okay. Um, than what some people call BDSM. It might not be for you. You might use the word BDSM to be bigger, but for me. Uh-huh. One of the things that I have found so beautiful is that if you have skills in the outside world, you can bring it to your kink life. And if you learn things in the kink world, you can bring it into your world at large. Cool. And so if there's something that you can bring from the kink community or bring from your kink learning, even if you're not part of community, your kink journey is figuring out not just who you are, but what are the little things you're picking up? So my former partner and I went hiking out in the woods and it was so beautiful. We both took our cameras and the whole time that we were hiking, we took pictures of everything that came along. So beautiful. 
And so we were also having beautiful little kinky moments because she was my girl, which means that um, we based our power dynamic off the idea that we were both grown adults, but she was a girl and I was a daddy as a way to, to think about how power play happens and to do a little role playing. And so we were having so much fun with my girl getting to be next to me as the daddy. as so we went and had this whole adventure. The next day, we looked at all of the photos that we took. My photographs were the waterfall and roots of trees and the overhang of all of these beautiful greeneries. Her photographs were of me and of the lizard that we saw and the other people that we ran across. Her photos were all about people. We had the exact same hike but how we experienced the hike were completely different. And so what I think about when people talk about, well, what can I learn from being in kink and what do I want people to take away from it? We're all maybe even on the same journey, but you will get something different out of it, even from your partner. And I think that's so key when we look at whether, whether we look at what do we get out of this as a whole or even how do we enjoy this one scene or this relationship or this encounter? How do we do this with that beauty and that delight, right? We're gonna each have a slightly different journey. Um, I would like to know if there is something that you could, if a piece of advice that you would give submissives that would start in a relationship so there maybe there are already a couple and they're starting to explore kink and especially the dominance and submissive um power exchange is there something that you would want to tell the submissive and the dominant and is there a difference in 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 uh, in gender as well the main thing that I want to tell people who are already in relationships is remember mm -hmm. that you're in a relationship. Yes, it's exciting and new to add all these kink and power exchange elements to it. That's so hot and beautiful and connecting, but you're also already in a relationship. And to examine what are you already getting out of the relationship that's good? What is already excellent? Because this can become the foundation for building your castle on. Mm -hmm. What do you have that can already be the foundation? Rather than saying, because I have seen some people who do this and, and it's not how I operate, but I see people go, oh, why did we waste the last 10 years of our relationship not doing this? I guess we're gonna start over from this point. What lessons have you learned in the relationship you're already in? What's beautiful about it? What's powerful about it? Have you been amazing co-parents? Then remember that. Remember that you are amazing co-parents. And why are you amazing co-parents? Oh, because both of you support each other when you're taking care of the kids or when one kid acts up and you have to be able to course correct them. You did it because you were a team. And I think remembering those pieces of how you were a good team, remembering those pieces of the hard times that you've already been in together can create that foundation for building upon with your DS. And I think that applies for everybody, whether you're submissive, dominant, or whether you switch, right? Maybe you're two people who enjoy both being submissive and you're going to play back and forth. Well, remember when else in your life you've gotten to play back and forth. You've already been doing this stuff. Even if the word wasn't, even if it wasn't kinky or BDSM, you've already been playing, having one person take care of something and somebody else take care of something else. Use the things you already have to your success. What, what would be your advice for a submissive at the beginning of her journey? Be gentle with yourself. Not everything's gonna go perfect. You might things that, find things that you told a partner that you liked and then you tried it and you're like, I, not for me. Or maybe you end up having moments where you cross over a boundary for a partner, right? Of your dominant. Or maybe you have a moment where you let yourself down. 
Submission is a practice. It is something that takes practice to hone, to play with, or to live in. Just like I think of meditation as a practice, the first time you sit down to meditate, it's not going to be perfect. Even, or even if you have that perfect time of sitting zazen and it's a wonderful day of meditation, doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect every single time. Meditation is called a practice because it takes practice. Submission is a practice and it takes practice. What's the biggest pitfall for submissives? For myself, as a submissive, it is very easy for me to base my entire value on someone else's opinion. Am I good enough? Am I worthy enough? Am, if somebody and I are no longer in relationship, do I even have a self-identity? And for me in my submission, remind, like having to learn the skill because I didn't remember it during my first breakup. I honestly thought if he's left me clearly, I must have no value and I'm a horrible submissive. That was the story I told myself. That was honestly the story I told myself. And for me, when that, cause that's a pitfall that can happen. And for me, learning the tool and that concept that I have value and it's why someone wants me to submit to them. They want me, I have value even before I met them as a submissive. And to remember that along the journey because they wanted to be with me in the first place. Who am I and what value do I bring to this? I think is really key because I forgot. That's amazing. That probably goes for us, for dominance as well, no? It goes for all of us. Absolutely. <laughs> because I've also met dominance. Actually, I will only simply speak for me in this situation. I love tying people up right? I love those moments of vulnerability or moments of beauty, right? Turning someone into a work of art or those moments of challenge, right? Pushing somebody till they're on that edge. Well, I broke my kneecap and I could no longer stand over people or do physical dominance in the way that I used to. And I had a story that nobody's going to go to play with me now because I'm in a wheelchair for who knows how long because I forgot that people were there to play with me, not just my skill set. They were there to be with me as a human being, not just the rope. And so if they want to be with me, maybe right now I can have my submissive kneel on the ground in front of me. Maybe I can fetishize having them get me a glass of water rather than me saying I'm not good enough. So I completely agree. It applies to everyone. Let's just say that I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm heart and soul submissive, but I love to dominate every now and then. I wouldn't consider myself a switch, even though it's quite easy for me to switch. I need a bit of time, but it's not, I mean, it can just pop up like, like this. While, even while I'm having a conversation with my master, and I'm in a very submissive position, something can happen that triggers my switch feeling, so to say. I struggled in, with it in the beginning and I think I'm not the only one. So how do, you, how do you find out that you're a switch and how do you cope with it? How do you, is it just a matter of practicing it and just figure out what you like and what you don't like? Or how does that, do you have any advice? I mean. You just said that you're a switch. So I thought like, you're the good person to ask it. <laughs> so I, I, funny enough, I'm actually doing a class uh, coming up soon for Wicked Grounds entirely on switching. So if anybody wants to spend two hours with me, feel free to come find me. For me, I have come to realize that I am a being that has many sides. And a friend of mine, Diamond Blue, who's another sexuality educator in the United States, says that each of us are gemstones. We have an authentic side, which is how we interact with our parents. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can be authentic in that. And we can be authentic at the office, 
Mm -hmm. and show that authenticity. And we can be authentic in the bedroom and show that authenticity. But if you look at them, they're not the same. It would be inappropriate to have me be the authentic self that I am in my bedroom with my children in many situations, right? It might have similar flavors and parts of our authenticity, but we have different sides. And so I love the notion that with switching, for some people to like a literal on off, for other people, it's a dimmer switch, right? A rheostat that maybe right now they're 2% dominant, right? right? They're 20% dominant. They're 98% dominant, but they still have that 2% that is still authentically submissive. And for other folks, it is turning that gemstone. This is who I am and how I am with this other facet of my inner emerald or ruby or diamond. And so for me, when I use the word switch, I use it because it's an easy way to start the conversation. But some people have a story that a switch means you can switch all of the time or that, and I know some people for whom No, there are some people they submit to and some people they dominate. There are some people for whom they are dominant in their submission, i.e. I bring all of this power and even my ability to, to have other people surrender to me. And that is the gift I bring to my dominant. And I think, for example, of people who have multi-submissive households, right, or leather families, have, you know, maybe three or four submissives in a group, but having a one person who is the lead, and now they're a dominant who is also submissive. That would fit me. I would resonate with that. Definitely. Because it's actually one of the things that I was, um, I'm super dominant in normal life. And I had this discussion with another submissive that that and she was and she was struggling with it because she said like I could never submit to somebody and that's and, and I told her that that's exactly what I thought, uh, but uh, until I met my master, because when I started playing with my master, I was still with my ex husband, with the father of my children, and um, so he knew what was going on and and he decided to try with me what would happen if he would bring in a bit of power exchange in our relationship. And he started pulling my hair in the shower. Now, you know what happened? I immediately, I I unleashed my hair. I grabbed his hair and I pulled him down like this on his knees. He was definitely not somebody that I could submit to. And I I think I'm, I'm very, very blessed that I met my master, actually, that I actually met somebody that I could submit to, surrender to. But do you think that there are also switches that could switch with the same person? Uh, for instance, I have a I have a friend couple, and they're both dominant, so they switch for each other. But there, it's definitely not there. It's more that they bottom, they don't submit. That's that's it's different. Well, if I understand correctly, like how I see what is the difference between submissive and a bottom. I've met a rainbow of people when it comes to what gets called switching. I know a couple who are collared to each other. Oh, they did a, they did a ritual where they both went, we want to be together and power is how we interact with each other as their primary part of their relationship. Uh And so they both wore collars and then they both clipped a leash to each other's collar at the same time. That's awesome as a way to say, I, what was important for them is they surrendered to each other, but who was submissive at any given moment didn't matter. It was about that trust, that connection. I know other people for whom maybe they can uh, submit to someone early on in an evening of play and connection or surrender or submit to them, right? Whatever it might be. But once they go into a dominant headspace, they can't go backwards, right? They could be like, I can spend the first three hours here, but as soon as we flip my switch, that's where I am. Yeah. Even with the same partner. Yeah. 
And so I think it's a question as well as what will serve your relationship and what is authentic to you. But I will name, right? Because not everybody's polyamorous. Many people are monogamous and that's fantastic. But I do also have two people in my leather family, one who is Ms. Senna. Mm -hmm. And she teaches in her classes a story of her and her husband that they are both dominant and they tried. And so she ties them up to a banister and afterwards they were like, that was just stupid. Like, what was that all about? Like that had, that did nothing for either of us. And he tried to do stuff to her and she was just like, why? What, what is happening here? Like, we both like the idea of playing with these things, but there was no chemistry. And so they end up finding a third person who wanted to submit to both of them. And for them, that worked for a while. And then they also got to try out the idea of each of them finding someone. And so even within folks who choose to explore polyamory or multi having multiple partners or part-time people, right? Like somebody that you play with, but you don't have a life and a home and an at like a personal connection with beyond yeah. the bedroom or beyond the dungeon, whatever you choose, I think it's about the communication, right? It's, and part of communication I will own though, is to say, Hey, that thing we did yesterday, are you available to talk about it? To make sure somebody's okay. And I want to talk about the scene we did last night. And once they say yes, because I'd like to see how we can make it even better for us next time, how we can make our erotic and personal connection even better and then bring up the hard stuff, right? Talk about the things that are challenging, but also say what's beautiful, I think is so important when you're trying out, especially switching. Wow. Have any experience with online relationships? I do have experience with online relationships. I've actually joked during COVID that I think one of my best financial investments was a fucking machine. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. I am so glad I spent that money. (laughs) My experience with long distance relationships have been based on having met that person in some way, shape or form before we started our relationship. Uh, But I was, I had somebody who was my submissive for many years who was based in Australia and I was based in the United States. And I only saw him probably twice a year for three or four weeks, right? Because I would go down to Australia, work um, and and then come back. Well, anywhere from two weeks to four weeks. And that was really hard. But one of the things we did was uh, find ways that he could be in service to me, even though he was thousands miles apart, right? And so for example, I had a time period where I didn't have anybody I could vent about my hard times with, right? Somebody who would just listen to you complain. (laughs) Because at least for me, that can be a really powerful thing from a gift from friends, right? And so we create negotiated an act of service he could do for me was that I could call him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He would not pick it up if he was at the office. And I knew that that was part of our negotiation and our agreements. And I didn't hold it against him if he wasn't available. I didn't complain about that, right? But that I could call him even if it was 2 a.m. his time to talk about the frustrations I had in my life. And everybody around me was like, that's not what dominance and some, that's not what service looks like. That's not what, and I'm like, it's the service I needed. Exactly, yeah. Right? It's what helped me and it's what had him feel useful and loved that he had a purpose in my life. And I loved that. And then also I would recommend, I had the honor of getting to edit a book called um, Spirit of Desire, Personal Journeys in Sacred Kink. And there's an author in there that she had an entire relationship that is just online and developed DS dynamics within it and talks about that process, but I can't speak well to her experience. Yeah, it just brings different challenges 
one of the things that I really love about it is that I think we're talking every day. There's not a lot of people, of couples who that I know that are living together, that are spending that much time together. Even if it's not physical, but it's like having that deep conversations and communicate on such an intimate level. I really like what the DS dynamic really brought for me. I, otherwise, I wouldn't have those tools. And now I do. And, and it's, 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 it's amazing how much connection I can feel just by adding myself at night. I'm wearing a sleep collar, then and I'm, I'm having a leash and it's connected to my bed. And when I connect that leash to my collar, that's so connecting. Well, with the career, not right now, but in my career, usually I'm on the road about a third of the time teaching all over the world on various things on uh, LGBT issues, um, kink, sexuality, psychology, and, and uh, religion. And because of that, even when I've lived with people, we still had long distance things. And so, for example, you talk about, you know, putting on the collar and it felt like you were being leashed. My uh, g- former girl and I, who, we, were to, uh, we lived together for almost seven years. One of the things we did is we measured a piece of rope that was long enough that I taught her and, and she knew, actually she knew a bit already, but we practiced her tying up her own ankle safely. And that was tied to the bed. And so she was in bondage all night. And the, the rope was exactly long enough to let her get to the bathroom to let her get downstairs to make a cup of coffee and to let the dog out. And so that was a way that we were still able to even do bondage, yeah. even though we were far apart. And we also had a ritual that was so, that was funny. We talk about the idea of how, getting different things out of the same experience mm-hmm. where I took a photograph. I controlled her, even when we were together, I controlled her lingerie, right? Mm-hmm. She had a very large and beautiful lingerie collection and I controlled what went on her body. And so when we were together, I would literally lay out her lingerie and she could plan then her clothing around it, right? Based on what I chose. But when we were long distance, I took a photograph of the lingerie drawers because there were multiple. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I would then text her each night and tell her what she was gonna wear the next day. But we also built into it that if I forgot or if I was busy, she had a backup, like just a bin of things that didn't match. And she was supposed to pull from that if I forgot. That way she wasn't mad at me or anything like that. We set everybody up for success. I felt like I was getting to control her body and having this ability to have like, what is the first thing that touches her skin? Is that which I have chosen? It felt so dominant for me. Mm. For her... (laughs) She felt like a spoiled princess who was getting to be loved and cherished and that she was being thought of every single day. Both were true. Uh, I can pick my own lingerie, but I have to send my master every morning a picture of something beautiful or, and sexy that I'm wearing. So every morning, the first thing that I do is, is that I pick something and I have to do this with him in mind. So I have to put on something sexy which is also giving me a kind of an assignment, make sure that you look sexy today because otherwise I might forget every now and then because I also like to to wear like, you know, jogging pants, <laughs> especially when just being at home and with kids and all. He wakes up and he has a, he has a picture of his sex slave in his, uh, in his WhatsApp. I mean, how, how good can it be? Yeah, it's, and there are so many of those rituals. <laughs> I think one of the things you just mentioned though is you are his sex slave. Therefore, the rituals involved are in alignment with that type of relationship. Yes. What are you trying to build together? What's the castle look like? What are you building together? Yeah. Well, and part of that is also, if we know why we're doing the ritual, if the ritual fails, our relationship doesn't have to fail. No, exactly. Because if the purpose of the ritual is to have my girl remember that I care about her, if that's the purpose of it and the lingerie thing doesn't actually do that because she considers it blasé, that wasn't our relationship. But if it did, we could check in and I can ask her, what would have you feel special and have you know you are mine? And then she can give me four or five ideas or we can brainstorm them together if she has no ideas. Yeah. Because it's important for like taking that moment. And as a note, 
They don't have to always be big purposes. If the answer is that it turns you on, great reason. If the answer is because, you know, my former ma'am who I was in service to, um, she had me every morning get up and text her as soon as I got up and text her as soon as I went, right before I went to bed. I thought it was because she wanted me to have her be the very first thing I thought of in the morning and to have her be the last thought at night that it was about emotional control, Mm -hmm. right? About the brain. I found out about nine months later, her actual reason is because we were on different time zones and she wanted to know when I went to sleep. So she didn't ask for something and then be frustrated that I didn't text her back. Yeah. Hers was complete logistics. (laughs) Mine was this beautiful, emotional, like, (laughs) I am so, this is so, we were different styles, but we still fit. And so I think that's something to consider as well, that if you are an analytical person watching this, these things don't have to be big emotional meanings. Sometimes the answer is, you just want to know when they got up. Awesome. That's really, I love it. So when you have something, when you're considering something, um, you're always taking into account what it does for you and what it does for the relationship, right? That's something that you said before. So when it comes to a moment that you have to choose, what do you do? When I have to choose between the ritual and the relationship? No, between you and the relationship. Whatever you're deciding to do, you're always looking what is good for the relationship, right? That is ideal, but not always true. Because I might come up with a ritual that seems like a great idea, but I didn't think about the longevity of the relationship. So for example, uh, a girl that used to be in service to me who is an amazing being, I asked her to do an act of service that I thought was super easy, right? That I thought was super easy, which was I lived in an apartment complex And I wanted her to go and do my laundry while I was out for the day and have it ready for when I got home many hours later. I thought nothing of this, right? Easy act of service she could do as a submissive, easy. Mm -hmm. I come back and the laundry is folded and I say, oh, thank you and continue on with the evening. And she got so hurt and I'm like, what's what's going on? And, uh, She was like, well, you don't appreciate how much work I put into this. And in my head, I'm like, it doesn't take much. You put on the laundry in the laundry machine, you come back 45 minutes later, you move it to the next machine and then you fold it. She had not done her own laundry in over a decade. And she'd never lived in an apartment complex that had a coin operated machine or anything like that ever. And so she had to go onto the internet and do research and figure out how do you load this type of machine and which, how much soap do you, she had to do so much work and I didn't keep her in mind and who she was. I thought that if this activity is easy for me, it'll clearly be easy for her, which is not kind to her half of the relationship. And then we had another situation happened She was such a great person to learn with and I'm glad we're still friendly with each other (laughs) because I look back and I'm like, oh, oh, I'm, I I am, I am a better dominant now, (laughs) but, uh, but she and I went on a vacation together and we learned about, and and I had seen stuff about slave poses. Mm -hmm. I thought they were very sexy. She thought they were very sexy. And so we spent the weekend training her for slave positions. We then went back to where we both lived and I for, I, I mean, I didn't forget about it. I thought it was a hot, fun time, but I didn't incorporate it into our lives, right? I thought it was a hot, fun time, end of sentence. She thought we were training to use it in our life. And so she kept waiting. When is he gonna ask for position number one? When's he gonna ask for position two? She kept practicing at home to remember these eight different positions, right? 
and I never asked. And so she started thinking that I didn't care about her because if I was doing all of this stuff and then she wasn't actually like, why is she putting all this effort into the relationship if I'm never going to follow up? And I didn't keep the relationship in mind when I started doing that protocol. When I started doing that ritual, I never stated that at the beginning of the weekend, right? We are going to do this just for the weekend. Or at the end of the weekend saying that was really fun as a thing to do for the weekend, right? To say that it's done. I, I didn't think about it. And therefore I wasn't thinking about the relationship. And I think that's part of the job of somebody who is dominant in a relationship is to think about those things and also set up the relationship to empower my submissive to say, sir, we were doing things on that trip to, you know, to St. Louis. We were doing all this training stuff. Are we still doing it? And I never empowered her to say that. And I think that's something I wish I'd done when I think about having the relationship succeed is empower her to do that. And how would you do that, empower her? Oh, I learned that with my next girl, which was uh, very much at the very, very beginning, we came up with this thing around SM, right around intense sensation, because she was one of those people who went quiet because she was afraid she was going to go too loud, right? So when she was being spanked, she got really quiet. And I ended up coming up with this sentence that said, why are you denying me the pleasure of your screams? I love giving intense sensations slash sadism, depending on how you like it, how you refer to it. I love doing that. And I want to see your reaction. Why are you denying me? And using that word denying clicked her head over to suddenly be, oh, it's not that I am being helpful keeping things. It's that I will help us by saying things, doing this out loud. And once we realized that worked for her, <laughs> I started saying, oh, why are you denying me the excellence of your mind? Why aren't you telling me about these things you know that I don't know? Because if I own you or if I have you, I want all of you. I want to know the thoughts and the resources you have. And maybe when I'm saying we're going to go out to dinner, you might know that my favorite restaurant's actually closed. And if you don't tell me, we've now wasted our time driving to that restaurant without, when you could have told me earlier, but you wanted to only submit to me while I then wanted her actually to tell me ahead of time, by the way, sir, do you know that that Thai restaurant's closed? Or if we're more formal, like we're in a public event or we're having a high protocol weekend or evening to say, sir, are you available for some information concerning dinner? And I can then choose, I don't want the information or I want the information, but then I get to make a choice based on what she just shared. I also think that, that most dominants are not waiting for a docile slave that's just following orders. And one of the things that I, I am emphasizing all the time in my videos also is that as a submissive you have your own responsibility. You're responsible for your own well-being, but you also have a responsibility for the relationship. It's not just a dominant very good i think to make somebody aware of the fact that she's making a choice that she didn't communicate with you and that communication yeah, is always a choice yeah and with the word denial it was about her specific psychology right it wasn't her being a bad person it was her thinking she was being helpful and yeah, me exactly. calling out sure. in that way Right. And I do that actually now that I have that awareness, I actually look around a room. This is talking about bringing kink skills into the world at large. Uh -huh. When I'm in a space with a group of friends and I notice one person is being really silent about a topic, uh -huh. I'll pause and go, do you have something you, that would be helpful to add to this, this conversation? Or because I can have a judgment, right? 
So that's if I'm being overly dominant, I might say that, but if I'm actually wanting to hear them saying, hey, you've been quiet for a little while, do you have anything you could add to this relationship, to this conversation? And I think those kinds of things of, especially helping our introvert friends feel empowered to do that, I think was a skill that I got to learn as a dominant with a submissive who was open to learning with me. And so she gave me the gift of now being a better friend for my introvert friends. I would like to ask you a few questions about your book. I'm reading it and I'm all the time. I mean, you can see I, I didn't read everything yet, but I'm, I'm using it and, and everything that's really, that I think that I should remember this, then I'm, <laughs> I'm highlighting it. Why did you write this book? Ooh. So when I got involved in the public BDSM community back in 96, I think this story takes place in 97 though, I had a moment when being flogged where I went into an altered state of consciousness. I went into a trance state and I flew out of my body energetically. I had this big spiritual moment. And afterwards I talked to my top and said, oh my gosh, this is just like when I've been in spiritual spaces and had these moments where I'm connecting to the divine. Wow. And he said, but I was just flogging you. And I shut down, right? I knew it was true, but there wasn't a language. And so I was really blessed over those next, you know, 10 years or so that I had people who one at a time, I would start mentioning things like, I think sub space or submissive space is an altered state of consciousness. Just like going into trance or hypnosis or people doing astral journeying, I think it's in the same concept. And people started going, yeah, absolutely. And other people talking about these different concepts and folks giving me different pieces of language to start working on it. And then a gentleman by the name of Raven Caldera, who also teaches on dominance and submission. Uh, he's written a number of books. He wrote an essay as a spirit worker and shaman. He and I know each other from that community. He wrote an essay on the eight different routes to altered states of consciousness in Northern tradition shamanism, right? For people who worship Odin and Thor, and he works with Hela. And he speaking about that. And I read this essay from him and I said, Raven, this is about kink, right? Like this is what we do. Yeah. And he was like, I wrote the essay about Northern tradition shamanism and I'm saying it playful. He's, a proud, he's an incredibly intelligent man, but he had this whole, he had like, we were having this moment where I was really passionate about it. And so I joke that I wrote the book to argue with him. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> and what I did when I had that moment is I looked at it and I started looking at, well, which of these routes do we run into most often in kink? And I, so instead of him where he talked about uh, rhythm later on, right, drum beats, right, or feeling our heart, he st I started with it because I think most kinky people that I run into have their first moment of trance with when they have that rhythm experience. I think so too. Yeah. I think it's very, I shouldn't say first, but it's common. It is more common. It, right? yeah. And that includes both the person doing the spanking and the person being spanked. Because I've met tops who go into top trance, who go into that headspace. And so the book also was my opportunity to really work on examining things from a religious framework because I've been very blessed uh, to get to explore religion in very different, in many different ways over the years. And so to examine, for example, with dominance and submission, how it also applies and works within Christian uh, uh, people who are monks and nuns, that that is being submissive to the will of Christ or to the will of the church. Yeah. And so looking at those comparisons in personal experience, right? And mm -hmm. also in religion and faith around the world of where can we learn from these different things because what we are doing with these moments of kinkiness are not 
new. And in fact, if we go back over the last thousands of years, many of them were not called kink, they were called magic. They were called sacred experiences. They were called faith. A sacred kink, it sounds very like, oh, you need to be a very spiritual person to be able to use kink as a sacred experiment. But I was wondering, is getting to an altered state, is that the goal in itself? Why would you want to be in an altered state? Mm. Thank you. That's a great question. There is this, there's a quote that I got to include in the book by a woman named, uh, uh, named Slavani. And she runs a public BDSM dungeon uh, in Arizona in the United States. Mm -hmm. And she joked that, uh, that just because you pay your $20 to show up to the dungeon, she cannot guarantee you a transcendental experience. You're paying to show up to the dungeon. What happens, happens. And so like people who are meditating, moving towards nirvana, that's the vision, that's the goal perhaps, and it is useful to set the goal aside to be able to simply sit. So to quote Roshi Baker, nirvana is an accident but meditation makes you accident prone. And so I think being open to the possibilities of these experiences gives us a space to have them potentially take place. Setting aside the goal, and also as a note, maybe your goal is to be able to have this deep moment where we're breathing together and by doing so we're able to have this moment of looking in each other's eyes and feeling into each other as if we are one being if it doesn't happen you still had quality time with a partner breathing and facing each other and seeing each other in your vulnerability having only one goal I think can shut us down from all of the magic out there in the world. And so when you talk about why would you want to enter into these altered states of consciousness, there are a thousand flavors. Do you want to do it to connect with a partner? Do you wanna do it to go into a space where time dilates and what we thought was five minutes is suddenly five hours or vice versa? Perhaps you wanna do it as a way to enter into your own vulnerability. I know people who do this work as an opportunity for catharsis and being able to cry your eyes out to let your spirit, and if you don't like the word spirit, to just let your heart feel lighter because you bawled your eyes out. And so I think for me, looking into the diversity of why people do altered states of consciousness in the world at large. And as a note, that includes simply getting high. There are people who dr do drugs, which is one of the paths as a note, that's one of the eight different paths is ethneogens or using chemical substances. Looking at like, there are people who do that simply to get high or to run away from their life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those are not bad things, but I think honoring why you're doing it in the same way that I've seen people do kink to get high and to run away from their lives. These are not bad things. Drugs have all kinds of different repercussions. If you wanna do this through having hot, rough sex, and then you get high afterwards and you get to lay around on the bed being like, oh my God, that was so hot, awesome. <laughs> Do it, delight in your high. But know that there are other people who are showing up to their kink because for them it is a religious offering. Where are you coming from? Where are they coming from? 
And I think to also honor that there are so many different paths. You said that those are the two that call to you right now, rhythm and ritual. And I mentioned the notion of ethneogens, putting things into your body that change your blood chemistry and brain chemistry, which also includes piercings, which also includes cigar play, right? It doesn't have to involve things that are what others would consider drugs. I know other people for whom it's about role playing or what gets considered the idea of manifesting a different spirit or part of yourself. For some people, it's about breath, moving that moan back and forth. I know for some people, it's about the idea of an ordeal, that which challenges us and has it come out, have us come out the other side being different than where we were at before. That, that fits for me very much in the master apprentice part of our relationship. Absolutely. And I know other people for whom how they like to enter altered states of consciousness is through that path of, of flush or ecstasy. That moment where you have somebody drag a bunny fur just slightly across your skin and so slowly that the world falls away. That's beautiful. Right, and so to acknowledge there are different things that we do to get to an altered state that are different for every one of us. And with what we're talking here today as well on your channel is people who enter into these altered states through making the world simpler, through handing their power or authority over to someone or something else to become a nun, to become a monk, but out of a place of love or sex or kink or relationship with a human, right? Entering that place of asceticism. I had such a different idea with asceticism. Is it, is it like, then in kink, is it what people do then when they're locked or in, in a cage? Uh, to me, the, um, uh, the meaning of the word ascet asceticism is uh, that you're giving up sex. That's how I know the word. So, but it's different, right? So asceticism is to strip down the world and to give up things. So for example, I can think of uh, various sadhu in India who take on a minimalistic path to their life and, for, and to such a degree that may, they might hold the same body position for years at end, or go live in a cave, uh -huh. right? The god uh, Shiva ended up gaining a piece of how he, like the, the wisdom of his journey through standing in a lake, holding up a pot of fire, right? Holding something above the lake. There's such power there. And chastity uh -huh. is a form of asceticism but I am using it in a broader context. And I, in the book, I do talk about chastity and um, uh, both chastity play and also the idea of locking sexuality away because they're slightly different concepts. Okay. But I personally believe that a dominant or top who chooses to spend all of their time and energy learning only one type of tool right they've they've chosen to hone their skill with one single tail right one whip that's all they do and they spend years perfecting themselves and that tool that right compared to like a lot of people i meet in kink who are like no i'm gonna learn rope bondage and leather bondage and flogging and i'm gonna learn piercing and learn how to do wet and messy play or wrestling or we're gonna learn all 40 of these things and it's gonna be so fantastic but it's the idea of do you go here or do you go here with your energy so for example some nuns who have handed over their sexuality by taking a piece of this away from themselves, they're allowing more depth in their spiritual practice. Yeah. So I think it's about looking at that which we give up. And I purposely in the context of this book chose to put it there, but it all, I joke about it, but every single one of those paths 
also apply to dominance and submission. Right. Every single one of those paths also applies to getting spanked. Every single one of those paths also apply to, to sexual chastity. Right. It's a matter of which way you approach it. There's one last thing that I would like to ask you about the book. Uh, you're talking about, uh, I'm calling it epic sex. What makes sex great? And I think that maybe it's all about uh, having an erection for like 10 hours or coming 48 times in a row. That is what makes it epic. But none of these things are in the list. It was really fantastic in the book to get to cite a lot of different research studies and projects that were not my own. And one of them that I listed was exactly what you're talking about. Peggy Kleinplatz's work out of the University of Ottawa, where she and her team got to do interviews with people that had been together for over 25 years, people who were sex therapists, people who were part of um, LGBT communities, et cetera, right? People who had been exploring sex and sexuality for an extended period of time. And from that, she ended up bringing together, uh, she and her team brought together a wide variety of answers and eight of them rose to the top. And I love the idea that authenticity and vulnerability were two of those that we've already talked about, right? That being there with a person that you are authentically yourself with can blow people's hearts and sexes open, right? For other people, it's the concept of being present in the moment. Am I here and now, or am I thinking about, you know, dinner I have to cook? Am I thinking about whether my pager might've gone off, whatever it might be, right? Am I actually here with my partner? Is it about connection? right? That we are actually, he not just me here, but we're here. So what does it mean, connection? A couple of different things. One is the notion of being with the being in front of you. Do I see you or do I see a story of who I think you should be? And am I, who is being me, not a story, not a simplification, et cetera, but am I in this moment connecting with the actual you? I think is one way of looking at connection. For other people, it's also the idea that in that full presence, we are diving in together, right? We are both here and now we are going on this adventure at the same time in the same place rather than one person using the other person. So that's how I would look at it. Yeah, they had four other ones that I thought was really interesting. One was the notion of extraordinary communication. Mm. The idea that I'm not, when somebody asks me, you know, hey, how are you doing today? You don't just say fine. You say, thank you for asking. These were the things that were real challenges and these were the things that were really beautiful. What about you, right? That we're actually present having full conversations with each other rather than giving it lip service. They also talked about the idea of sexual and erotic intimacy that you and I are going into this piece of our sensuality, our sexuality, or in this case, our kink, engaging in our yeses. Right. So it, it's actually a lot of it comes back to being honest. So in a way, if we could conclude from these things that you're saying and said, being honest, gives great sex. Being right? honest sets us up for the potential of great sex. Absolutely. You're increasing the chances on great sex. Oh, that's, that's good, that's good. Out. But I agree because because being honest, I mean, it's scary as fuck and it hurts sometimes. And But the moments that I realize that I'm really honest, 
it also breaks open something with, within me. It's not, not even just how the other person is receiving me, but it's also about... Uh, we're always making up stories for how we want people to see us. And if you can be with a person that you love and you dare to be really honest and to be really yourself, I can I can understand why it gives great sex because you're actually now you make love with your soul and not with your story. Exactly. How many people are aren't just doing in the bedroom what they think is expecting expected from them? Uh, I mean, I should really moan now because I think I should enjoy this. And I think my partner would like it if I moan. For instance, it's one of the things that I did when somebody went down on me. I only found out that I'm a masochist like three years ago, four years ago now. Somebody licking me is not giving me anything. I mean, I like it. It's pleasant, but it's not, it's not a turn on. Uh, in the sense, it's not it's not getting me anywhere. And and at one point, I get frustrated, and and I'm 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 often I faked it like so many times just because I didn't want, didn't dare to share that this was not the type of sex that I was looking for. And the moment that I finally could find that freedom, because this is for me is all about freedom, the freedom to be honest, the freedom to say to my partner like. This is not what I want, but please just take out your belt and <laughs> use it. That's, then there's so much openness and then there is, it's, that, that's what creates the connection, I think. And that's what happens when great sex happens. And if opening up your mouth to say the words out loud doesn't feel safe right now or doesn't feel quality to your body, because it's okay to have us not know how to use the words yet. Yeah. That simple, powerful act of, you know, leaning down as somebody was going down on you, kissing them and, you know, then, you know, getting, having them bring up their mouth to your lips or having to move on to something else is a yeah. flavor in that direction too. So if you're shy right now, that doesn't make you bad. It doesn't mean you can't have great submission. Remember, this is a practice. So practicing in those ways too of yeah. using your body and using other ways of communicating can be really powerful too. The most powerful way of communication that I found in being honest is, is reporting and journaling. Mm. Um, I find it also often, I just don't have the words. And I've, I've, my master gave me an assignment like a few weeks ago and he told me to make a submissive statement. And he sent me a video of another submissive and she created one and he said like, like make the one for you and recreate it in some way. And I recreated it and it didn't feel good. But I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't find the words to what was, what was wrong. And so I sent it to him, I edited it and all and it was a nice video and it was looking really nice. And if he wouldn't have known me, uh, you would probably have thought that this was a fantastic video. But my master, he saw this immediately and he said, what did you, how, how did you feel about making the video? And, and, and then I, and, and because he asked him and then I could think about it and then I could write down what was going wrong for me. Because what I was doing, I was trying to recreate what she was doing and I, it wasn't from me. So I'm going to recreate it and then from me, but it, it just took time to figure it out. And, and that's the wonderful thing of journaling for me is that it gives me time to actually sit with myself and write down how do I feel about it. And then as soon as I start writing, I can recollect those, I, those feelings that I had then. And then I'm, usually I have the time to, and I often fail when I have to do that one-on-one -on -one immediately after a scene. But it, it took a bit of time after that, makes it for me a lot easier. Mm. Well, I love that you know how your brain processes information. Everyone's different though. Exactly. I know some people for whom right after something's done, grabbing their audio recorder and saying it is a great yeah. tool. Yeah. I know other people for whom that, blog, that video blog entry works fantastic. I know some people who want to process right afterwards if their partner is available. 
I also know for myself that talking with a dear friend who has an understanding of what's been happening, right? So finding a, if you're submissive, finding another submissive to talk with about it out loud before doing that writing. Because if you're somebody who processes in that way, if all you get is the journal entry, I've seen people who shut down and don't know what to say. They're like, ah. Uh, yeah, or it's very analytic and like this happens then and this happens then. And that's also something that I saw with other, with other people's like, yeah, journaling is not for you. <laughs> and I will also think there was a tantrika who I used to, back when I was a professional dominatrix, um, before my gender transition, I had a tantrika who I got to co-dominate with a couple of times. And her system was that after sessions were done, after rituals had been finished, because she would start with ritual, do work together, and then close with ritual, she would then have the submissive bring food, and all three of us would break bread together and talk about the things that were what he called snapshots, or what she called snapshots, excuse me, uh, which were the idea of in the evening, right, in this time we've spent together, what was a magic moment? She asked them to tell him her negatives or things to improve on a week later, right? Or a few right, days later. Right. But that night, what was a magic moment? What are things that stood out for you? Because just like that photo trip, mm. right? just like it's we're going to see stuff. different things. And I will always remember this one gentleman who we co-dominated who his, one of his snapshots, she was, he was just like, she and I were on the bed and you stood aside, sir. And it was so powerful because it felt like you were absorbing our energy and critiquing us. And here I am eating my noodles. And in my head, I was like, that was the moment where I couldn't remember what to do next. I had run out of toys and we still had an hour left. Like I didn't know what we were gonna do in that moment he was experiencing magic. He was having something transformational and feeling seen. I was having that moment of feeling lost and confused. But now when I look back at that memory, I also see it through his eyes. And that is the gift we can give each other through doing processing in some way, shape or form is the gift of seeing it through our lover's eyes. That's Beautiful. Thank you so much.